Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jayakumar. Thank you very much. On Bloomberg Quint uh, after these uh, third quarter results. Uh, now, while this quarter has seen you know your loan book improving, your home loan uh, book uh, improving quite a bit, uh, it's been marred by three points. Uh, firstly, on the increase in the gross NPA. Secondly, elevated slippages, uh, elevated provisioning. And there's also that small matter of uh, net profit not meeting the estimates that the market had uh, largely. So just trying to get a view of what exactly happened during the quarter. No, I think actually the performance of our slippages on the retail, agriculture, MSME, I mean the non-corporate segment was, was actually positive in the sense they were lower than the last year, last quarter. What has happened this quarter is a couple of blips arising from a te large telecom uh, slippage and a, and a large power slippage in the power sector and a slippage with respect to, the, uh, with respect to uh, infrastructure. And uh, these three accounts have basically uh, resulted in the slippages being higher than what was it in the last quarter. But once you exit out and look at the core book, uh, that's pretty much stable, I would think. Yeah. And we and we have got to watch the space. But I and I do think uh, going forward, hopefully, we'd not have too much of these big big tickets in our portfolio that would require that would warrant them flowing into NPA. So that uh, that target or the outlook that you had provided earlier on the gross NPA book between 45 and 50,000 crores, that stays as it is. You know, one of the challenges we now have is to be a little bit careful with respect to what we can say on a forward-looking position. But let me put it to you this way, that um, our endeavor is to, is to, is to be very close, as much as possible, strive to be where whatever our guidance is that we are given from time to time. And that would include both the gross operating profit as well as the numbers relating to the provisioning number. So let us see how that plays out in the last quarter, because on a pro rata basis, we are behind this guidance number. OK. Uh, you know, this this point keeps popping up. Uh, and we saw yesterday uh, the country's largest bank reporting a massive loss. Uh, so is it too unfair to expect you know, banks and bank management to have sort of a, at least a quarterly outlook of, you know, what their book is going to look like, where exactly these NPs are going to come from, and what their provisioning number might look like. Is it too unfair? Or Because these surprises keep popping up, and the management says it's over, now it's done with, we've reached a peak, and then suddenly the market is surprised again. I think uh, I, I think you if you give it a, a quarter or two quarters, I would think you would start to begin to see a fair amount of stability in the banking sector. I think we, are, we should be coming to the close of the cycle. That's at least what I think it is. Now, the question still remains whether the provisions are adequate, coverage ratios are adequate. But even there, I think a lot of catch-up is happening in every institution. So I would say give it a quarter or two quarters, and then we should start to see a fair amount of stability in, in, in being able to estimate the outcomes. Right. Uh, glad you mentioned the coverage ratio because if you were to look at how the coverage ratio is playing out, uh, if you remove that uh, return off technical return off accounts, uh, there's a difference of about 90 basis points between the coverage ratio either way. So, just to understand, is writing off probably the best way to deal with the kind of uh, stress that the banking system is facing? At See, I think the way to look at the coverage ratio is not one end of it which is the plus TWO or the other one without the TWO because what has fully been provided would also have some level of recovery. Mm -hmm. So probably it is somewhere you have to take some kind of a point between the two numbers. Whether you take the average or it go up to the lower quarter or the higher quarter is a matter of assessment, but it's certainly more than uh, the 59%, more so because when you look at some of the assets which are in the TWO, uh, they're also beginning to show signs of resolution. They do have asset backage. It may take a little bit more time to enforce the security or realize them, but the fact is they are not all going to be zero. So I, th I do think uh, I do think there is the numbers, the real numbers, leaving us is somewhere somewhere between these two numbers. Sure. Uh, just uh, you know, shifting your focus to the liability side of the book, and this quarter's result showed some drop in the total deposits uh, for the bank. Just trying to understand where that came from and what L large amount of those deposits are essentially large fund providers, mm -hmm. uh, where the renewal of the deposit is really based upon the opportunities to put them to immediate use. But the core customer deposits, which is the granular deposits, whether they are in the time deposit, whether they are in the current and savings account they continue to be very positive. But we do, have, in our portfolio, have a certain amount of large fund providers who 
are tactically we keep in the, depending upon the necessity for immediately some immediate short term loans. So that part of it is how it is. So we continue to manage that carefully from a cost of fund perspective. Would you believe that there is a chance that these deposits might have to be repriced higher uh, going ahead considering the interest rates in the system are sort of firming at this point? Well, that's the that's 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 one of the points that we have to keep in mind that the interest rates are going overseas in the U.S. Interest rates have been going up, and in India the the outlook on inflation, etc., is suggestive of potential increase in the interest rate. We need to be careful about it. It's not necessarily that has happened, uh, but then the question raises that if indeed rates go up, then how the repricing profile of the assets and liabilities work, and would we come out better in 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 a, in a 12 month sense? Sure. I do think our portfolios are reasonably um, reasonably balanced in terms of repricing. May not be on a quarter to quarter basis, but if you had to take a full year number, we, I think that should kind of match itself out. Uh, on the NPA provisioning, because that's an important part of this whole, uh, you know, asset quality game, uh, there's been a rise of about 20, 93%. Now, I remember you talking yesterday as well as today at the uh, analyst presentation that there is this element of, you know, you providing more than what is actually regulatory required just so that it's, it's a matter of prudential nature of the bank. But is it wise to do this at this at a time when there is a challenge to the system uh, to provide higher? Rather, would you not wait it out and probably at, at a better time you would provide higher? No, we're not providing actually higher. What I was trying to explain to you was that we continue to revalidate the security value, the realizable value, and then it results in some correction that has to happen. And those are the provisions. It is arises not because of slippage, but because of the fact that the assets that you might have as security may be, you know, showing some reduction in value, whether these are current assets or these are fixed assets. And when the valuation of the security is redone, then you come and say, okay, if this is the value of the security as per the IRAC norm, what do you then provide? And therefore, that part of that exercise, some element of it is there. Sure. But in the past, we were taking provisions on a more principal basis, and we've taken a fair amount of coverage. At this point of time, um, we are doing, it is a fairly balanced approach, but the important thing is that eventually, we're trying to stabilize the net NPA number in absolute value. And so if you look at through the year, that number, you know, might have gone up a bit and gone up a little bit, gone up a bit down, but it's fundamentally stable, which essentially means despite all the slippages that have happened, on an on a totality of the risk basis, the, the, the numbers are being pretty contained. Now, the argument is that the market does not necessarily give value for the coverage ratio. It, it tends to ignore that. Well, that's a point of view, right? My our position is that if you have a higher level of coverage, it effectively means that you're more capable of securing results. But as we go to the index provisioning rules, you have a further freedom of action because we're more closer to the index provisioning norms than if you were to be at a lesser level of coverage. Okay, okay. Just talking about this uh, accounting standards, you know, are we anywhere close to ready for, for these accounting uh, standards to kick in? Because the RBI doesn't have a sort of a clear timeline as to when banks are expected to implement them. But uh, as far as Bank of Baroda goes. I think, uh, see, we have to work on the principle that these, these, rule, regu these the changes will happen. It's as part of the stated program. And so, and, and so, therefore, we are prepared. Now, there are some areas on which we need to work out a little better. Uh, for example, the notion of what is an estimated loss. And, uh, you know, the past trends have been very elevated, as has been the case. Would the same numbers historic would be, would, would be should we have the use numbers, same numbers pro pro prospectively as well? So there are these intellectual debates and points of view. But that said, we are ready, for most part, to be able to move to the in that accounting. Would you think that a staggered sort of implementation may work better for the banking system? I think uh, what, what I think is probably being discussed, and I'm not 100% certain about it, is that probably the from a capital perspective, that's exactly what you say is probably what's going to happen. Mm. From a capital adequacy ratio computation perspective, that's probably what's, what's likely to happen. But I do not have any definitive uh, views on them and uh, don't have a definitive inside information or even any kind of guidance given to us other than what is available to the public domain. Looking at the uh, loan pool that the bank has at this point in time, about 45 odd percent uh, is uh, below triple B and in the unrated uh, segment. Uh, you know, what is your outlook going ahead on from that portion of the book? Because uh, while we have seen some of the higher rated books, uh, uh, loans also uh, deteriorating in, in shape, you know, some of these lower rated are at higher risk. 
So what would you say? I, I, would, I would put it to, to, in three different ways. The first is to look at how the portfolio itself is moving. Mm. And if you see that the incremental growth and the total amount of uh, assets in greater than uh, A and greater than triple B have been continuously been increasing. The unrated portfolio exists for us because of our overseas assets where there aren't any real mechanism to get it rated because of the absence of rating agencies and their understanding of the of the Indian uh, customers and you know people, Indian businessmen doing their work, etc., etc. So that's a challenge we deal with and we've got to find out some solution by which these could be rated. So that's a large part of the unrated pool that we have got of the unrated pool. In addition to that, there may be some MSME and SME segments of customers because the ticket sizes are not to the threshold that requires to be rated that may that are not rated, but on a collective basis, those numbers add up. Right. So I think I think what we are trying to do is that if you have a single B account, for example, I don't think it is possible to close those accounts. There aren't people who might be willing to refinance them. And therefore, our objective is to monitor them closely and support them adequately and do hope that as the economy improves as it's, as it's happening, then we can see those companies also bouncing to better health. Sure. Uh, you know, just to bring focus, because you mentioned your international loan portfolio. Uh, now, there are many questions uh, raised uh, by authorities in Africa, especially South Africa. There's uh, there's articles being written about you know Bank of Baroda's role and Bank of Baroda's uh, you know performance in in the in the sort of crisis that is unfolding there. Uh, probably a chance to clarify. Yes, certainly. I will tell you that we are fully aware of what's happening with respect to the issues in South Africa. We are working with the regulators and other authorities with respect to whatever else they're doing for completion of their exercise in ascertaining uh, the issues that are there for the system as a whole and insofar as they relate to Bank of Baroda. Till this time the results are concluded, the analysis are concluded, it would not be appropriate for us uh, to, uh, to start to comment on it. We should let the course of uh, the investigation get completed. But the one thing I could say to you, though, is there are a number of factual inaccuracies in those reports. I don't want to get into point-by-point point remittal. This was said, and that's not what it is. But the fact is that there is a amount of inconsistency, and I'm hoping our point of view, in relation to the points of view expressed by the media or by, by anybody else, is finally established when this investigation gets completed. Sure. But uh, going ahead, what is, the, what is your plan with that business? You know, uh, that See, one of the, the things world. I wanted to emphasize is most of the issues that we're discussing in South Africa and in other markets where we've had similar issues are primarily historical issues. Okay. Some of the issues in South Africa date to 2010, 2011, 2012. And then we're using the current methods of KYC and AML and saying, hey, did those comply? You know, they're historical issues. and and. After that, from 2015 onwards, we're significantly strengthening our compliance environment, KYC, AML, but also in terms of the organizational structure, making the compliance organization report to the central office. And the entire bank organization itself, the executive director in charge of risk management does not have business responsibilities. We've done a fair amount of work with respect to automation of work. And we're also kind of saying that we should be more focused in the larger markets than have then have then be present in markets where our shares are limited or presence is not necessarily required from a customer perspective as well. And you're working through those 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 franchises. So then that business uh, percentage, the uh, you know, whatever part was coming in from your international business that is expected to go down. We would I wouldn't put it that way. What 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 is happening is that the 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 locations where we stay, where we have a larger presence there will be much more focus with respect to them and then the opportunities of those businesses to grow will be there. But at the end of the day, uh, the real issue is how important are you to those markets, how well you, how, how important are you to the customers, how well you can serve them, how large is the opportunity pool itself. Remember, we work in India, which is one of the largest market in terms of number of people. And then the question of capital and what is a judicious way to apply the capital. Those are all the points that needs to be considered. Uh, while looking at that, looking at the approach. So it's a part of a process where we are reevaluating our presence in many of the markets, and some of them we need to leave. But some of these things you don't announce till such time as you've got the consent of the host country regulators uh, with respect to what's happening. 
And then there are other markets where we need to put more energy and focus on. Mm -hmm. If you take a South Korea, look at Japan. You know, those are markets where we could potentially increase the size of relationship we have. So it's a part of a continuous rebalancing. But what we are trying to do in all of these exercises is that we are trying to serve our customers across the geographic requirements they have. And therefore, uh, supporting them in four or five countries, making them funds available or trade products available or introduction to other retail customers and vice versa are being done, all of which are principle to our ability to differentiate and support our customers in, in, a, in a more complete. In some sense, we are a small global bank, you can say, insofar our customers are concerned. So we are financing pharmaceutical companies, expanding and setting up factories in the United States. We have customers of ours in UK of Indian origin who are setting up, uh, setting up factories and investing in business in, in other markets. And we see a large amount of work where we're supporting the UAE with respect to logistics, trade, new manufacturing facilities where we have contributed significantly in those markets. So those markets will continue to strengthen and grow. But within that overall scheme of things, there is a reallocation that is happening, which is a natural part of any business growth. Lastly, on the uh, on what FI19 and FI20 is going to look like, because a large part of the banking system expectation depends on these two years, and they're expecting a turnaround. They're expecting a sort of... So there was this uh, discussion a couple of days before in one of the publications that hosted Mint, and the overall consensus that emerged over there is that there is a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Speaking specific to Bank of Bordeaux without getting into any numbers, I think our opportunities look good. A, we are growing. Uh, B, we are getting, we have capital to grow, uh, and uh, and the the kind of investments and the and the restructuring and the reorganizing, sorry, the the entire transformation exercise that we are doing is positioning us for better growth. And one is also expecting that the NPA cycle, whether it is this quarter, next quarter, the following quarter, will have its run. We are also hoping some of the non core assets that we have, we liquidate and get better returns out of them. There's some optimization that will happen. So when you put all of these things together, there's more re more reason to be optimistic. Uh, I mean, there are very good reasons to be optimistic, but I really don't want to get into a forecast around what those numbers will be uh, at this point of time. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Jayakumar, for joining us, taking some time out of a busy schedule. I know we are, you're on your way to Dubai right now. Thank you. Being with the Prime Minister. Thank you so Thank much. You much.